a lot of the challenge of explaining this to people is is appreciating that these are banking operations. This isn't about the U.S. taxpayer lending money to foreigners. That's not at all what's happening. It's an expansion of the balance sheet of the Fed on both sides. It, there's not real resources being transferred by these liquidity operations, but that's actually hard to explain to people because <laughs> our intuitive layperson concept of a loan is I can't lend you a bicycle unless I own a bicycle. But if I'm a bank, I can lend you money just by expanding my balance sheet on both sides. And that seems fraudulent or something on the face of it. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. For me, the best part of my podcasting journey has been the opportunity to speak to a huge range of extraordinary people from all around the world. In this series, I have invited one of them, namely Kevin Coldine, to host a series of in-depth conversations to help uncover and explain new ideas to make you a better investor. In the series, Kevin will be speaking to authors of new books and research papers to better understand the global economy and the dynamics that shape it so that we can all successfully navigate the challenges within it. And with that, please welcome Kevin Coldiron. All right. Uh, thank you, Niels. And uh, welcome, everyone. Um, our guest today is uh, Perry Merling. He's a Professor of International Political Economy at Boston University. Uh, many of you will probably have heard him on uh, Bloomberg's Oddlock podcast, where it seems like anytime there's a crisis, they bring him on to explain to us what's going on. And he may have also unwittingly founded a kind of new genre of economics books, where we tell particular economic history through the life of one of the key participants. Um, he did this in one of his earlier books called Fisher Black and the Revolutionary Idea of Finance. And he's here today to talk about his new book, Money and Empire, Charles P. Kindleberger and the Dollar System. So Perry, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us and uh, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Looking forward to it. So in, in speaking of, of books that you published in the past, in 2011, you, you published a really uh, wonderful and I think quite important book called uh, the new Lombard Street, and and you say that's kind of a biography of the Fed, and that you wanted to follow it up with a biography of the dollar, and you ended up choosing to tell the story of the dollar through the life of Charles Kinderberger, and I, I wanted to ask well, why Charles Kinderberger. I mean, I think a lot of listeners would might know him as the author of Manias, Panics, and Crashes, which is a hugely popular history of financial crises. But it's probably fair to say he's he's not someone who was as well-known as, as Fisher Black. Um, so why why choose to tell the story through, through his life? Um, well, originally, I had in mind writing a book more similar to The New Lombard Street um, that was uh, a biography of a fictional character. Uh, but, uh, the, but when I discovered um, the Kindleberger archives at MIT, actually, it was, it was, I actually discovered him more in the, in the Modigliani archives. There was a correspondence between them. And they were both at MIT at the same time. And then I knew, then I found there were 50 boxes at, at, at and, and this was a very good story. So 
I reverted to my former way of telling, like like Fisher Black. And so I had in mind that here was a man whose dates were just perfect for me, okay, because he was born in 1910, approximately the time when when the Fed was born, 1913. And he went to graduate school in 1932 to 37, sort of in, in the Depression. So he was formed during this formation period of the global dollar system. And he, were, he couldn't get an academic job, so he was at the Fed for a while, and then he was at the BIS. And so... And then he only started academia in 1948, more or less right after Bretton Woods. So his dates allowed me to tell the the, the sort of buildings Roman of of a person um, sort of seemed to fit. And there was a lot of material. And another thing that makes these books work, you you that I invented this genre. I don't know, possibly I invented this genre, but it seemed to be a way to tell the story that it's important to choose the right person, okay? Someone who, I always say, is like a spider in the middle of the web, that he has contacts with everybody. So MIT became the central department, right, in the in the post-war period. Um, he was in the State Department during the Marshall Plan, and he was involved in, you know, so he was actually a spider in the middle of the web, although he was a staffer, mostly. He did not seek the limelight. He did not want that. You know, he was a scholar, really, um, even when he was in government service. But so he was really kind of perfect for this story. And if you've read the book, you maybe see why <laughs> he's more perfect than you might think. And uh, and perhaps I should add, you say that I think it is true that to the extent that anyone's heard of him, um, it will be Mania's Panics and Crashes, um, which is just coming out in its eighth edition. So he lives on through his co-authors of the of the new editions. Bob McCauley actually is the is the uh, uh, co-author in this case, who was a student of his. Um, he was a Harvard graduate student who took his classes at MIT. And uh, so there's a, there's a connection there as well. But I think that people who read Mania's Panics and Crashes maybe don't understand exactly what Charlie was about in that in that book, or, or the the context of it in terms of the rest of his work. You've read my book now, and so you know that there's there's a lot more to this guy. Um, and one of the reasons you haven't heard about him is because his approach to international monetary economics, which I call the key currency approach that he got from John H. Williams, is a minority view in the post-World War II period. Okay. His student Bob Mundell um, and and the Mundell Fleming model became the dominant frame, um, but that was never his view of how the world worked, and so naturally he's pushed aside a, a little bit. Plus, you know he's a pre World War II kind of in- intellectual formation, so he's not seeing economics in the post World War II way, think or even in the MIT way, imagining that economics is really a job of mathematical modeling and statistical modeling. He was never about that. Economics is a, is about confronting the major problems that are confronting us with whatever tools you have. Um, and uh, so as I say in the book, I really think of him more as a kind of intelligence analyst, that his formation was during World War II when he was in the o- o- OSS in London. And his job was to sort of tell the generals where to bomb in order to wipe out the the German uh, the German V two rocket capability or the or to or to impair their economy or to to prevent resupply after D Day. You know, all of these were very concrete problems that you have to have something to say to the generals, even if you don't have all the information you need to run a nice regression, or you don't have a nice little mathematical model, you're putting together this little piece of data and that little piece of data to say, I think this is where you should bomb. And I think that for that formative experience in World War II was uh, the fact that that worked. That's another thing to say. That, and that the Marshall Plan worked, right, is even though it was not backed up by any of the tools of modern economics, okay, gave him great confidence in these methods, that he, he knew how to think about economic problems, even without the tools of modern economics. I'd like to talk about some of those formative experiences. And, and, and as you were talking, I actually remembered one of my own semi-formative experiences with because um, Charles Kinderberger wasn't unknown to me because, you know, early on when I first met my wife, we we lived in London and we go away for these weekend trips and she's a big reader, but fiction, and I'm a big nerdy reader of nonfiction. So I think I showed up to a, our first trip with this. I don't, I can't remember what the book was, but it was a nerdy economics book. And on the jacket, 
it had an endorsement that said sizzling reed charles p kindleberger and she just loved that because number one she she <laughs> had never heard an economics book be described as a sizzling reed but also she just loved the name charles kindleberger she thought that was perfect for an economist so ever since then if i if i show up with a with a book she's like well what's kindleberger think of that one but let's talk about so Char, as you say charlie's born in 1910 he got his phd in 1937 so you know i guess his studies would have been looking back at the sterling system that existed in the late 1800s uh, early 1900s pre-world war one and that would have and did inform his view of you know i guess how a key currency should work so can you explain maybe to to the listeners how that system evolved and and, and operated the sterling system you're speaking of yeah so yeah. the sterling system um was operated out of london um and uh, the bank of england was the lender of last resort to that thing maybe a couple of things to appreciate about that it kind of grew it's important to appreciate that it grew sort of organically, that it was built on the uh, domestic bill market inside Britain um, that was for financing local trade. But the rest of the world started to use this bill market to finance international trade, even if no part of the trade was in London. So the sterling bill market was the way you did international trade by the by the end of by the end of the 19th century. And sterling as a currency was convertible into gold, but mostly nobody ever converted it because sterling was the actual reserve that was used by the rest of the world. Now, some of this was you know, connected to empire, um, the British empire, and in particular, the role of, the role of India as a big uh, trade surplus country um, that held its surpluses at the Bank of England um, in, in, in London, which therefore financed the British deficit in the, tr in the trade. So, so Br Britain was a, was a big capital exporter um, during this period. So this pattern of trade that that basically London was the bank for the world where people held their reserve balances um, even if they weren't British okay if they were Indian but also if they're French or or whatever it's the it's the it's the city of London that is the banking system for the world and so there's a great book um, by the way, I should mention by Marcello De Cecco, who you can't interview because he recently passed away, um, about that system, um, and and it's called Money and Empire, and it is about the Sterling system. And so I am deliberately signaling with my title um, that I am trying to bring that story up to date um, and to and to pay homage to him as as writing as writing a book about how that system with an explicit empire, you know, the British Empire, uh, worked, whereas in the U.S case, as, as I'm sure we'll get into, it worked out a little bit differently. But that was what was in people's minds. The key currency people in particular, everyone thought after World War I, okay, that we were just going to return to status quo ante. Really, that was, everyone thought that. And, uh, and that's what was attempted at Genoa in, 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 in 1922. And, and then when Sterling went back to uh, gold at the pre-war par at 1925, um, everyone thought that that's what we were doing. The Fed, remember, was only created in 1913. So the notion that the dollar was ready for world, uh, no, <laughs> no. Uh, Sterling, Sterling was the center of the world. But as more and more countries returned to the gold standard, this put more and more pressure on sterling. And the Bank of England, because Britain had lost a lot of its overseas investments and other things, it, it was too much pressure. And so it was, it was September of, of 1931 that the, the Bank of England was basically forced off of gold. And, uh, and there were attempts to cobble together a central bank cooperation agreement that would support sterling. Um, this but is the uh, tri tripartite agreement that you talked well, about. Well, no, first it was the world the World Economic Conference of 1933. Okay, was when was first, and uh, and and particularly the 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 Fed was prepared to do something here, um, but Roosevelt said no and took and took. Uh, uh, the U.S. off gold and therefore off sterling too. And so there was this period of really international chaos. And then in 1936, that's when there was explicit cooperation created in the tripartite agreement for the first time. It was really not so much by 36 about supporting sterling. It was about uh, supporting a fixed exchange rate system between sterling and the dollar so that sterling and the dollar would sort of jointly 
be the global currency. That was the idea. Um, but that all fell apart because of World War II finance. So, but I, I mention that because that's a little piece of history. Most people think that the international monetary system was created from the mind of Zeus, you know, at a little hotel in, in New Hampshire in 1944. Okay. And I think that's, that's just a myth. I wanted to um, pick up on that point. Actually, you know, it's, it's as you were describing the Sterling system, so many things were racing through my head. One is that there seems to be, a, you know, an interesting, you know, substitute India for China um, and Sterling for dollar, and you get a kind of our current system operating in, you know, in a way that's somewhat analogous. Um, but what, what, in terms of Charlie's thinking, What's interesting to me is he's looking back on the Sterling system, and as you say, it wasn't created through grand design. It uh, it evolved organically initially as a domestic financing system, and then hey, there's that's a pretty liquid market there. Um, we can use it to finance international trade as well. So he's looking back on on how that system evolved and operated, and then there's this kind of interregnum period, the you know from say. You know, end of World War One through the end of World War Two, where there's, as you say, a lot of monetary chaos. He's also observing that, and I assume then that the kind of the combination of the, I guess, stability of the Sterling system and the chaos of the interregnum period, where you know the bank of, you know, the UK was unable to be the the supporter of the system, and the US w- was unwilling, informed his view of you know what the post World War Two, you know system ought to look like? Well, that phrase um, that the that the Bank of England was unable and the Fed was unwilling, this is Charlie's phrase, and it comes from a later retrospective. So in, in 37, he's not really thinking like that. This is from his book, his 1973 book, The World in Depression, Okay, um, which is another actually uh, pretty well-known book among economic historians. Certainly, it, you know everyone still reads this reads this book, and your and your listeners should too. The, wor- the world in depression. It's uh, it, there's a second edition, 1986, um, which he re- which he revised, um, which I would recommend um, in favor of the first edition. But um, to go back to your question, what was he expecting? So he's a graduate student, okay, in in the 30s, and his main professor. I tell this story in chapter two, um, was, was, was H. Parker Willis, who was a real Bill's doctrine guy, but, but he had been very much involved with his own professor, Lawrence Laughlin, in, in creating the Fed in the first place. Okay. And one of the big ideas of creating the Fed in the United States was to unify the dollar, the dollar system inside the United States. Okay, you use so in the inside the United States there had not been a central bank. This is very important to appreciate that there had developed a system of clearing inside the United States that did not rely on a central bank. Okay, that there were these money clearing systems in different regional centers, and basically J P Morgan in New York City was in effect the central banker. Of for for the for the United States, uh, at least for the elite New York banks, part of it. But whenever there were these agricultural crises, and they were periodic, um, they would draw on London, the on the gold stores of, of of London, and so they used. And so London was the central bank of the United States, and London didn't like this very much because it was the United States was becoming a very large uh, country, and these imbalances were a problem. Was was this like a um an early form of a swap line type of thing, um, or was it the? Well, I, I mean, it wasn't a swap line because there wasn't a central bank, <laughs> um, but it was it was operating through private private bank flows, um, borrowing money market, international money market kind of thing, and so H. Parker Willis was really a domestic guy creating the Fed. And I think that I, I make the argument in, in chapter two that that's where Charlie got the, an early idea that the optimal way of organizing the international system was just by taking that idea of unifying the, the dollar system inside the United States and saying, now we have to just do it for the globe. And so it was, it was not much more complicated than that, than saying that that's the future that we should work toward. Okay. That and and of course, so the chaos of the '30s is a very disappointing period. Um, but the but his his opportunity to join the BIS seemed like an opportunity to join maybe the possible future central bank of the world that had been created after World War One. We can talk about exactly why. 
he came to think, uh, I think through the influence of, uh, you know, an analogy with the Sterling system, that what we're that what we're going to do is basically New York is going to become London, <laughs> and that what uh, now the United States it's important to appreciate did not have a, a large sort of bill market, and that was a big disappointment at the beginning of the Fed because they thought they were going to be operating in this bill market, um, but it did not because the United States at the time was a developing country, <laughs> so it it really long term capital was what was needed um, mortgages for and and government railroad bonds and mortgages for farmers there were there the banks did have short term credits but they were not really short term credits they were short they were credits that were expected to be rolled so you know these are 5 year mortgages uh, interest only mortgages that are expected to be rolled when that 5 years comes um, and that of course is a rather vulnerable form of finance if the markets are just so so it turned out you're you're making the point about the analogy between the sterling system and the dollar system. The important point to appreciate is that the domestic money market was not at all of the kind that was inside that that was in London. Um, and so you're going to have to build a different kind of system on on top of that. And a lot of what the Fed was getting was getting used to in the twenties is like, how are we going to do? How are we going to be a central bank if we can't really operate in in the bills market, in the real bills market? And they came, they invented open market operations, you know, so that because there were all these treasury bills that were left over from World War I, that Benjamin Strong, uh, the, the head of the New York Fed, um, basically in the 10th annual report uh, of the Fed, kind of invented that way of intervening in 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 markets. But of course, this is this is in the 20s. You can see they're learning how to be a domestic central bank. They're not at all ready to be an international central bank. Not with, you know, even worse is the political challenges. I mean, you need to appreciate, your, your, your listeners need to appreciate, to get a central bank at all in the United States was a great political challenge, okay? The Americans hate, uh, hate government, okay? And they hate, they hate Wall Street, okay? And what is a central bank, okay? It's government plus Wall Street. Okay, it's that's that. So they particularly, you know, th- that was a very tricky political thing to get a central bank in the first place. Okay, and the other thing that Americans hate, okay, is kind of the rest of the world. You know, xenophobe because it's such a large country. We, and so a central bank that's going to be the central bank for the whole world? No way, no way. <laughs> I guess so the, the devil, Res- devil incarnate. The Federal Reserve Act. Okay, if you go back to the original text, is very explicit that this is a real bills. You know, it's going to be lending to manufacturing and to farming, not to the government. Okay, and it has no international responsibilities. It is responsible only for the United States. It's very clearly written. And almost immediately, it violated the first of those because of World War I finance, okay? It wound up having to lend to the government to support the uh, bill market, the treasury bill market to, to finance World War, World War I. And so it wound up after the war stuffed full of treasuries when it wasn't supposed to have any treasuries at all. And so immediately it evolved. I mean, some, you know, conspiracy theorists don't like this. They say the Fed, like, abandon its, and we should go back to the originals. There's people on the left and on the right like this. But I tell the history. I say, well, there's a reason they did this, okay? They're responding to circumstances. It's, I'm telling a story of, of growth, of development, of responding to crises. And World War I was a very formative crisis for the Fed. So yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. And in fact, you know, you could think about, and I think you you do say this in the book that ironically, where we are now in terms of the role the Fed's playing uh, is you know very very similar to what maybe Charlie would have wanted or imagined, you know, um, especially with the you know seeming permanence of these uh, of swap lines. So the Fed has sequentially responded to crisis over the years, and we can argue whether or not whether their response has been correct, but it's got us to a place where they kind of are operating like the central bank for, for, the, for the world. So maybe we could, we could roll the clock back uh, a little to kind of the uh, end of the Second World War. What, what, had, um, what had changed um, domestically with the U.S. that allowed the dollar to 
you know, take over from sterling as kind of the, the global currency. It, it wasn't entirely a willingness amongst the, um, you know, a political willingness in the U.S. to do it, but it was more, it seemed to me more like economic circumstances had changed to facilitate that transition. Well, the the United States emerged from World War II, you know, the only developed country that was not war damaged. And it, of course, had financed the whole war through Lend-Lease. Um, it had sent some troops over there uh, at the at the last minute. Most of the deaths were not Americans. They were, they were others. But a lot of the finance and the material, the war fighting material, um, 50,000 planes, Roosevelt promised, you know. So there were, there the, the United States ended World War II undamaged. And if it were not going to take responsibility for the world <laughs> for reconstruction, there wasn't anybody else to do that. So this was the, it would quite definitely, everyone appreciated at Bretton Woods that the U.S., okay, was going to be a surplus country in, in trade for quite a while, okay, because everyone else was needing to rebuild and they needed the U.S. help to do that. The question was, what kind of financial arrangement would make sense there. And they were listening and remembering the problems after World War I when the overhang of the war debts that basically because of reparations at Versailles, Germany owed a lot of money to France and England and, and France and England because of war debts owed a lot of money to the United States. And the United States said, how you pay that is not our problem. Um, if Germany pays you, that'll be good. Okay. And so that worked for a while because the U.S. lent Germany money through the Dawes plan and the Young plan. I talk about that in the book. Um, but it, it was always a pretty fragile arrangement, and it collapsed under its own weight, basically. So the Germans repudiated, and, and then the war debt was the Hoover moratorium. So after World War II, we didn't go down that route again. Okay, there were no reparations. The war debts were bas land lease basically canceled. Um, and so we started afresh, and in fact, with fresh money. That's what the Marshall Plan was, okay, was, was fresh money to, and it was a grant, it wasn't a loan, um, to get this whole thing going again. So it's essentially an, an equity infusion into the European economies. Um, the way Charlie came to understand it, yeah, I suppose that's right, um, because it's not alone um, the important thing was kind of to get to get manufacturing to get to get restocking going um, because of course I mean we've experienced some of this because of covid now you know that the entire European economy was on a war footing for a long time okay it wasn't really organized around uh, producing for trade or or for much less multilateral trade and so you had to shift over to a peace economy and you had to shift over at a time when when much of your transport system is destroyed and your housing stock is destroyed. So it was there was a lot of reconstruction that was needed. There was we we in the United States had the same problem of converting from a war economy to a peace economy, but our economy was not destroyed. And so we had a little post-war uh, inflation here in the United States um, uh, because of that, through because there there are bottlenecks and so forth. But it got sorted. It got sorted out, um, and uh, then and then we started the post-war boom, and uh, where all that wartime savings um, was being spent. So so there was a very strong demand, um, and of course abroad, people were spending as well. The Marshall Plan was a demand infusion to the United States economy, and that was only a couple of four years or so. So that got that going. This was, you know, you were you were you were flashing back, but flashing forward, the the, the construction. So the the important, you know, in Charlie's mind, and I think this is really correct. The the important thing after the war was uh, getting the United States and was integration of Europe and the United States to create a a functioning. Uh, industrialized part of the world, okay? Um, and that was basically the United States on its own, not using Bretton Woods or anything, you know? So the IMF was about the periphery. It wasn't really about about Europe. The Marshall Plan was about, was about Europe, and this was unilateral. This was, you know, the United States operating on its own as a leader. This may give people... I don't, I don't think that the, you should really say that the Fed is the... Uh, global central bank by itself right now. These swap lines that you mentioned, this is exactly right. I think it's better to say that it's a committee of central bankers, <laughs> that, that the swap lines are the mechanism through which this committee of central bankers is managing global monetary 
uh, affairs. And now it's not, I mean, you, you, don't, you haven't mentioned this, so I will. I don't know if I even say this in the book, because the, the, new, the, new, the swap lines were around since the global financial crisis. And, and they're older still. They were, they were, they were uh, around to help um, Europe return to convertibility in 1958. Those swap lines were run out of the, on the BIS balance sheet, um, but they were effectively dollar swap lines. Um, so they're the same kind of thing that, that we're talking about today. The new thing that is now on the Fed's balance sheet is the FEMA repo facility, which provides basically discount window access to countries that don't have swap lines, um, but have uh, treasury securities that they can use as collateral. And this was created after the COVID crisis um, and is, is, we're going to find out what what, it's new, and we're going to find out how well it works in the coming crisis. I mean, you know, we're in a tightening cycle now, and yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's so many questions I want to ask there. That, that, that FEMA repo facility was not heavily used in, in COVID, um, but I think you're right. It could potentially be much heavily used in, in the future, which brings to for the question of, you know, that the Fed has introduced these new policy tools, or in the case of swap lines, old policy tools, but formalized and expanded them. And the repo facility is uh, a new policy tool, but that's all been done without without any kind of legislative oversight or, or it, it certainly wasn't something that people voted on. So we've evolved into kind of the central nexus of this network of global central banks that supports the monetary system. But it, it, it hasn't really been explicitly made clear, I think, to the public that that's actually what, what's going on. It will be interesting in, in, the, you know, in the next crisis when, when those facilities get used more aggressively, if, if that's something that's considered popular or not. I wanted just to try to circle back to something you said about the, the, the situation the U.S. was in at the end of World War II that was a surplus country, um, and at the same time gradually taking over the role of kind of the, again, maybe not central bank to the world, but kind of the center of the, or the key currency. And was, was that a unusual position or unsustainable position to be in for the key currency country to be a surplus country? I mean, ultimately, and I think Charlie talked about and wrote about this, but ultimately it needs to provide, you know, uh, liquidity to the rest of the world. Um, and so did the U S um, was it kind of predestined to evolve into a, a deficit country because it, Assume this role of the key currency provider to the world. In other words, did it does it does a key currency provider have to be a deficit country? Does it have to run a deficit in order to create the key currency that the rest of the world uses? And if so, how do we know? And I think this is a problem Charlie wrestled with. How do we know what the kind of sustainable level of that deficit is, how much liquidity provision is necessary versus kind of a sustainable trade balance. Um, well, Charlie's view on this, um, which I, I guess I, I, I'm i sufficiently convinced of that I'm, I'm playing with it for our current situation, um, is that, in fact, there is no reason that you need to be a deficit country on the trade account. That's what you're talking about, okay, um, in order to be the key currency country. because the And so he would use the word international financial intermediation, okay, that you can provide um, dollar reserves to the rest of the world simply by lending them to them. So, so that the – and the, through the private banking system. So the big New York banks that are making dollar loans to Europe, okay, are also taking in dollar deposits from Europe. Okay, that's international financial intermediation. Um, and those dollar deposits are the dollar reserves of, of out, out, outside. Now, that in Charlie's view should not be considered – running a deficit because you're it, it's it's an expansion of the balance sheet of the banking system on both sides okay that there it's uh 
the way it's measured in this, it, the way it was measured in standard national income and product accounts, um, it showed up as a deficit. Really, we're selling liquidity services, okay, to to abroad, and, and of course, this is the this is where Triffin comes in. You know that the gold the gold was leaving the United States, and it was ultimately less gold in the United States than there were short term liabilities abroad, okay. That all just means that you're moving to a fractional reserve uh, international international system, which is nothing wrong with that. But it it yes, if there was a run on the dollar, there wouldn't be enough gold to cover every single dollar liability. But why would there be a run on the dollar? The dollar the people are accumulating these dollars to use them as international reserve, and so he he tried. Here's where we come back to where I was saying at the very beginning, that the key currency approach is, is a minority view in the post-war period. Everyone is thinking, like, here's this model, Mundell Fleming, that applies to every country, including the United States, which is the creator of international reserves. And so uh, Kindleberger thought, well, no, you need a different accounting system for the, the country that is supplying uh, liquidity reserves. And and in 1969, um, actually, when Mundell was was editor of the Journal of Political Economy, he he wrote more about this measuring measuring uh, uh, balance of payments um, in in balance payments equilibrium, where he made these arguments. This is his sort of mature statement of this in 1969. Uh, so you don't have to be a deficit country in order to be a, to be the supplier of world liquidity. What you and how much should you be supplying? Well, in in a way, you could apply the kind of monetarist growth rule. You know that on average, if the the world economy is growing at three percent, well, then its demand for reserves will be growing at three percent, and so this kind of international financial intermediation thing should be growing at three percent um, on average. Now, you're also going to have some responsibility. When there are crises, various places, the demand for reserves is is going to go up, you know. And so, being lender of last resort means that you're going to grow more than three percent um, during a period of time, and then presumably claw that back later later on. Um, but so that's the way to think about it, anyway, is to appreciate that uh, that that the United States is a bank, as he said. Okay. Now, I mentioned 1969 when he wrote this, okay, because very shortly after that, Nixon took the dollar off gold and basically unilaterally, okay. Um, he was convinced by the economists who were arguing that the dollar was weak and that you needed a flexible exchange rate in order to, uh, in order to help the situation for the United States. Um, Charlie rejected both of those things, um, but it happened anyway. And uh, so the consequence of all of that, fast forward that to what you were saying, is that the it wasn't New York that became the center of international financial intermediation. It began. It happened offshore. It happened in you know in London in the euro dollar market and the euro bond market. All of that business Charlie was imagining would be in New York because he was analogizing to the sterling system. Okay. That business is not in New York. There's no actual particular reason that it needs to be in New York. It, it apparently, you know, it can be in London, it can be in Singapore, you know, it can be. And so we have a global dollar system now um, where there are centers of dollar intermediation in the global banking system that are not inside the United States. And so they do not show up in the U.S. balance of payments, right, because they're, they're, in, other, they're in other countries. That's how we sort of solve this political problem in a way, by pushing it offshore. And similarly, you know, the Fed is, as, a, as I say, it's not really the central banker of the world. It's a, co- it's a cooperation between central banks. So the offshore elements of this are as important as the onshore elements and are, in fact, sort of the line of first resort. If you, you know, if you look at what's happened to the balance sheets of the ECB, of, of the Swiss National Bank, of the Bank of Japan, you know, so these are the buffers for the, the global dollar system, actually. I, I was, I mean, that's a that's a really great explanation. I was a little, I guess, when I initially read Charlie's comments about, you know, I think he said that was, you know, the dollar is finished as international money. Um, I think that was in reference to the kind of final end of the, you know, the the yeah the Nixon nineteen seventy one nineteen seventy three yeah yeah that's so right. So I was surprised by that because to me. And, and I, I may have my history wrong. I mean, obviously, you know much better than me. But to me, that to some extent, the uh, 
Nixon was bowing to to kind of market pressure, and I always saw Charlie as someone who you know appreciated that the monetary system was a function of what the market wanted. It wasn't again created from on high; it was a response. And so, to the extent that going to a pure fiat system um, was a response to market demands, it seemed to me a little surprising that he didn't like it. But then, it there, there seems to be kind of this tension in his thinking, maybe not tension is not the right word, but slight contradiction. On the one hand, he's a pragmatist, right? He, he says, you know, let's, um, you know, let's allow the market to determine things. And when markets don't work, we can step in. On the other hand, he's also kind of an idealist as well. And maybe a little, it's like he wants the world to cooperate. He wants, you know, he, he thinks that um, we can have kind of an international system where people look out for the public good as opposed to just their own domestic um, concerns. And so perhaps what he was really um, upset about was the fact that there was, it seemed like there was no no longer any kind of international cooperation with the with the initial phase of taking the dollar off the uh, off gold, that it was basically, we'll just, you know, we're just going to let this thing rip and not care anymore. So there's a lot in there. Let me take a piece at a time. He really was blindsided and by Nixon 1971, okay, um, which he explicitly analogized to the Bank of England 1931. Okay, so remember, he grew up as this being the moment when the international monetary system basically broke down, and what happened after it broke down? Worldwide depression. Okay, so he is kind of that's the frame that he has in his mind. Okay, that didn't happen, and he was surprised that it didn't happen. I mean, he's he's glad that it didn't happen, and so he's also and and, and even in seventy three when you went to flexible exchange rates, that's like you're embracing hot money. Why? That's not good. You know, it's the, the he's imagining that short term international capital markets and long term international capital markets are basically going to close down as they did in without you know with exchange volatility as they did in the 30s. So he's imagining that this is, and that didn't happen, okay? So, and why didn't it happen? Well, you could say one reason was because we didn't have all of this war debt overhang stuff that 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 that, that, caught, that was a problem, okay, in the 30s. Um, but another reason is, is that bankers were, maybe because of that, the bankers, bankers did not stop using the dollar, okay? They moved it offshore. It was bankers who moved it offshore. It wasn't governments that moved it offshore. Nixon, I think, quite clearly wanted to kill the dollar system. He had been trying various American politicians. This was this is not a Republican initiative. It was shared. <laughs> um, they were trying to not have New York be the center of the global capital market um, throughout the 60s. And Charlie was upset about that. Like, this is getting in the way of, of the emergence, the organic emergence of a functional dollar system. You're trying to kill it. Please stop trying to kill it. You know, understand that this is actually a good thing for the globe. But they finally did kill it, okay, as they thought in 1971. But the bankers didn't allow it to die, that's the point, that they created systems of foreign exchange hedging. You know, this is the beginning of, you know, active, private, forward futures markets in that, that allow you, at least in the short-term credit markets. And in long-term credit markets, businesses that are making long-term investments in other countries aren't really thinking. They're looking through the fluctuation of exchange rates, right? They're thinking, is this a good investment or is it not a good investment? What do I care if the, if the exchange rate is fluctuating around and around? You know, so this is the beginning also of sort of global reach, the multinational corporation that is thinking about its operations. And so Charlie l looked I mean, he studied the, the multinational corporation. And so he was surprised that we did not have a return to depression. What we had instead, interestingly, the monetary chaos that had led to deflation in the 30s, monetary chaos, there was pretty a lot of monetary chaos in the 70s. Um, this is when I grew up. Um, I think I'm a little older than you. And, uh, and it led to inflation, okay? Worldwide inflation was the consequence until we could get things sorted with Volcker in 79 and then Plaza in 85. That's how he viewed it, that this is about putting the international monetary system back together. And there are two pieces of it, okay? One is that the U.S., under Volcker, is going to accept responsibility to be the leader of that system, 
Okay. Which it was not, you know, in 1971. Do you see in sort of an irony there and that Nixon um, taking the dollar off, off gold in 1971 because he didn't want, <laughs> he wanted to destroy the dollar system. He didn't want the dollar, you know, the, New York to be the center of, of global finance. And that in, in fact, that action, you know, only, as you say, seven, eight years later, facilitated the deepening and broadening of the dollar system. Well, as I say, it was the action of bankers that deepened and broadened the dollar system. It was then, it was, it was, it was, it was Volcker's, uh, you know, movement with the Fed is kind of recognizing this new fact, okay? This is about the politics coming into line with the economics, just as, you know, Bretton Woods 44 is sort of recognizing the dollar is the emergent world currency. So the, the politics comes after the economics. Um, and often the economics is not visible because it's only really people who know how banking works that are seeing this emerging system. Um, so the U.S. said, OK, we will accept our leadership responsibility again, um, and the rest of the world, having experienced the 70s, like flexible exchange rates, did not prove to be the panacea that everyone thought they were going to be. So the rest of the world learned from that experience too and said, you know what, it's not so bad to let the U.S. be the leader. <laughs> we will be, we will cooperate with the U.S., you know, going forward. That's what that's what Plaza was about. That's how Charlie viewed it. Um, but this is, you know, this is an evolving Darwinian system, and so nothing is ever fixed forever, right? And so there are more challenges, you know, that come later, and there are economic challenges and there are political challenges. And, and that's what we're, you know, we're in that process today. So it's, it's an ongoing, and it's a seesaw system. He always used that word, that it's two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And so the, the, it's not just Charlie, but... <laughs> Pretty much everybody has said, "Oh, the dollar's a goner," you know, and uh, repeat it sometime in their in their in their life. Um, and but it has never been a goner, really. You know, if you look at the broad sweep of history. And so, why is that? You know, that's sort of I just I just wrote a paper on that that's just come out from INET. You know, trying to figure out why is the key currency point of view a minority view since it seems actually to be correct okay that that at least in terms of its it, it, it that's the way to understand why do we still have the dollar system after charlie said you know who was an advocate of the key currency approach but he thought that the politicians had were had the power to kill it and it turns out they didn't actually have the power to kill it, okay? And it grew up, it grew up, it grew up anyway, and the politicians had to accommodate to it. You know, the politics had to find a way. And so I think that's going to be the answer, too, to, you know, this new role of the Fed in COVID. And, and you know, that we're, what you notice in COVID is that the global, the, 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 the turning on of the liquidity swap lines to the global north happened almost immediately, okay? And... It, and no one made a peep about it, you know. Whereas in the in the in the global financial crisis, there were congressional hearings about this. So so we have accommodated to that, okay. The politically, the new piece that we haven't accommodated to because it's new, okay, is I think this FEMA repo facility. Um, but remember, the collateral are Treasury securities. So if your counterparty defaults, all that happens is the Fed winds up owing, owning more treasury securities. And they own lots of treasury securities already. So it's there, this is the, a lot of the challenge of explaining this to people is, is appreciating that these are banking operations. This isn't about the US taxpayer lending money to foreigners. That's not at all what's happening. It's an expansion of the balance sheet of the Fed on both sides. It, there's not real resources being transferred by these liquidity operations. But that's actually hard to explain to people because our intuitive layperson concept of a loan is I can't lend you a bicycle unless I own a bicycle. But if I'm a bank, I can lend you money just by expanding my balance sheet on both sides. And that seems fraudulent or something on the face of it. It seems magic. And yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that's kind of, uh, it, I think banking has always seemed a bit like magic to, to, to many people. I, 
I, I want to. We've got about ten minutes left, and I, I want to try to circle back to some of your own own work here. And I think our discussion is kind of naturally leading to it. You have this concept of, um, and I, I don't know if you were the first one to come up with it, but certainly I, I first became aware of it through reading your book. Of the Fed has evolved from being a lender of last resort to a dealer of last resort. That that makes total sense to me because you know the the global i guess the global financial market has evolved from a kind of a bank based system to a market based credit system so you know you titled your book the new lombard street and the original lombard street was you know written by walter batchett and he has this kind of famous central banking rule that you know crisis you lend aggressively against good collateral but at a penalty rate and in the dealer of last resort framework, um, you're no longer, I guess, lending. Uh, you're no longer kind of the lender of last resort. You're the dealer of last resort. What is the budget rule for the dealer of last resort? And I know you talk about this in your book, but I, I, I want the, the readers to hear how you think the, you know, how, what that analogy is, how the central bank ought to operate in a crisis as the dealer of last resort. Um. So uh, Badgett never used the word penalty rate, okay? He used the word high rate, okay? And, the, and this is important to appreciate because and, – and, and, here's, and here's why, okay? Because the whole idea is that in a crisis, the central bank is, pro- is, is, is providing lending but at a kind of unattractive rate so that when the crisis is over, it, this new lending will naturally roll off the balance sheet because – People who are paying that high rate will 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 enter into the private market at a better rate. You know, once the crisis is over, and they'll use that money to pay back the the central bank. So that was kind of the idea. Okay, it was also to discourage people from borrowing who didn't need it. It's like make it expensive. Okay, now so the the analogy to that for the market based credit system, which you're quite right. That's why I invented that word dealer of last resort to and it, and and why you need to expand the concept because of market based credit. Credit, which, by the way, has to do with globalization also, and so we're going to come come back to that. In this particular case of the global financial crisis, it was it, we, we were starting this securitization business um, with the U.S. mortgage market, um, and that was being fun, being actually booked abroad in these global banks in in Europe because of the euro dollar system and things like that. So the analogy to lending at a high rate, okay. It comes, in my mind, from thinking about the economics of the dealer function, okay? The dealer function, and here we start to come around to some of the things you've you've thought about, too, that dealers are suppliers of liquidity in these markets um, by quoting bid-ask spread, that they're willing to, to give provide trading options to other people um, for a price, okay? And what dealer of last resort, then, is is actually a rather wide bid ask spread is the idea okay that you you uh, you want to be uh, willing to accept collateral okay but not on very good terms and uh, it's terms that will when the crisis is over people will find there are better terms that they can get. And so this will naturally roll off the, the, the balance sheet of the central bank. So one of the challenges um, is trying to do that. Uh, in a, and, we, and we see this after the crisis was over. A lot of the facilities that were created in the global financial crisis did, in fact, roll off. Okay, they did in fact roll off. They were that sort of dealer of last resort. But then we did QE to try to goose the economy, and that meant low rates. So this is sort of not not lender of not dealer of last resort anymore, right? This is being driven by I think not understanding how monetary policy needs to run in a market based credit system. Okay, and uh, I think probably we we have we, this is maybe for another time, longer time because we're running out of time. But you know, they they're they're in economics. There's a kind of uh, framework of thinking of of general equilibrium, which kind of abstracts from liquidity, and so imagines that the natural price of liquidity is zero. 
Okay. And that is not the case in, in the key currency view or the money view, which I teach. You know, so what you do not want is the central bank making liquidity a free good because then you get all kinds of craziness happening. So we are on the same side, okay, in that, in that regard. Um, but the dominating sort of intellectual apparatus is not yours or mine, you know, so that, that, so I would, I would distinguish between dealer of last resort and then QE. You know that that it they it's it's hard to distinguish because a lot of the balance sheet operations are similar. You know that you're expanding the balance sheet on both sides, but but the prices will be different. Okay, um, and if you look at the at if you look at the emergency lending facilities, um, they rolled off. They mostly rolled off. But the decision that we were going to support the mortgage market kind of at low rates. That meant that you are now making loans that are not going to roll off, <laughs> um, and, and unless you unless you're willing unless you're willing to take a capital loss, you know you're going to be holding these to maturity or until they refinance, you know, which is really how they're rolling off is through is through the refinancing operations. But now interest rates are rising, and so no one's going to refinance. So so they're going to they're stuck with these positions. Well, what about the swap lines? Do you think of those as a Dealer of last resort function or yes. a yes and, okay so they are do. dealer of last resort so so this gets to the globalization piece could I could I just ask one question about that because I was really quite I followed it quite carefully during COVID you know who drew on it how quickly they paid back but also what I was noted what I was frustrated with was you know again that. They, it didn't seem like they, it was provided at a wide bid ass spread. I mean, it was, I don't know, a few, was it 20, 25 basis points or something like that? It was not an expensive facility. I mean, they, to, having said that, they did roll off, as, 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 you, uh, as you point out. But do you think they, they should be structured in a different way? Or are you, you, are you kind of happy with the way that, that, that they're structured? So they were structured as 50 basis points around covered interest parity, okay? Um, that was the actual agreement, okay? In the moment of crisis, they lowered it to 25, okay? I think to send a signal that, you know, we want you to use this, you know, feel free to use this, okay? So um, you could maybe argue about that. I mean, you need to be in contact with the market if you're, if you're too far away. But the other thing to appreciate about this is that that's the spread for lending between central banks, okay? Um, this isn't the spread that private people are getting because what's happening is that is, this is between the Bank of Japan, let's say, and the United States and the, and the Fed, and then the Bank of Japan is going to add some more on, you know, because all of the credit risk is being taken not by the Fed, but by its counterparty, by the Bank of Japan. Um, and so presumably they're not charging just 25 basis points, they're, they're charging some more. So the effective outside spread that's facing the market is large than you might think, looking at the terms of the liquidity swaps. I haven't actually looked into the pricing because I think a lot of that is proprietary. And but it would be interesting to know that. Okay, and um, and it might even be that foreign central banks even provided, you know, uh, 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 even better financing because they're trying to help their national champions. But that's on them. Okay, that's not on the liquidity swap lines you know, re arrangements between the United, if they want to subsidize lending, um, we need to deal with that in some other way. It's not, we can't, we can't tell them what to do. Um, but these are, you know, large, unlimited swap lines. And they, you know, in COVID, they blew up, you know, very, very rapidly. Whereas in the global financial crisis, we were a year into the crisis before these swap lines, you know, became clear <laughs> This, this is what we need to put a floor under this crisis. And it was exactly, you know, that's exactly when the floor was put, when, when, when those swap lines um, opened. So yes, outside spread. And that's, and, and, and I'll just say one last thing here about this. Got to appreciate that after the global financial crisis, the global north is largely not expanding credit at all. Um, there's, even though interest rates are very low, you know, there's not much credit expansion. The credit expansion is happening in the global south. Um, and the system that we developed to backstop that, you know, were these liquidity swap lines because they're, they're borrowing in dollars long term, you know, from, you know, Japanese insurance companies or something, which are, which are, are trying to balance their, their exchange 
exposures in the FX swap market, which are and also borrowing term from Europe, which are trying to balance their exchange ex- in the in the euro dollar swap market. So the liquidity swaps that you ask about, you know, these 50 basis points around CIP um, are are actually functioning to support global capital markets, okay, in this regard, because it's about the funding of this expansion of the global dollar system to the global south. And here's, you know, we circle back to the beginning. This is definitely what Charlie wanted. You know, after World War II, he he thought, you know, he was a believer in the Hansen stagnation hypothesis. And he thought, therefore, the, the only way forward for the global system was, was development of the global south. This is going to be the engine of growth. Okay. Just as the U.S. was a developing country and was an engine of global growth for a period of time. Now we need to, and that means capital flows to the global south. Um, and, uh, at the time he's thinking about this, you know, all these capital markets are closed down through because of depression and war. So, so we need. So he and his buddies always thought the World Bank was much more important than the IMF because it was about as a provider of long term capital um, until the private markets can kind of get their act together. And they kind of never did get their act together until quite recently. You know, this expansion of, of dollar-based credit to private, you know, or, or national champions, put it that way, mostly it is, um, in the global south. This is really since the global financial crisis. And it, and it comes from the fact that there are zero interest rates in the north, um, but 10% interest rates in the south. <laughs> so um, if, you're, if you're looking for yield, that's where you're going to find yield. Um, and so, that's, so this is, again, I, I, I come back to this point. The dollar system expands geographically two steps forward, one step back. Okay. There was this two steps forward going on in the last 10 years okay, to the global south. Okay. Now we're testing that. That seems to be what's happening right now. And so bits of it will break, um, and we will see if we have enough backstops in place to keep that break from spreading. Um, personally, I'm kind of uh, optimistic about that, but we'll see. And meanwhile, other stuff you know, is, is breaking, and that's being tested too, crypto and so forth, and, the, and other business models. So, so we're in that phase of the one step back where we get rid of – things that weren't such good ideas in retrospective, um, and we create a foundation on which we can build again in the next phase. There's a couple of questions I wanted to end with, and and one I think is, is perhaps a little bit out of the blue and maybe too big as an ending question, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway, which is, how do you think Charlie would have viewed the seizure of the Russian central bank reserves um, after the um, Ukrainian invasion? Well, I'm just thinking about historical analogies. Um, He was... Actually, in the book, you do talk about an episode, I think, where the, you know, Czech gold reserves were kind of forcibly, um, you know, given up. To the Germans. That struck me... to, to the, the Germans right, to the in, Germans. in World War yeah. II, okay? And yeah. that the BIS was complicit in this. Um, and, the, uh, and that that gave the BIS a bad name. Um, because basically what happened was some, some German soldier put a gun to the head of the, of the central banker of Czech, Czechoslovakia and said, put in that order to transfer it to, 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 to the German central bank. Um, and everyone knew that that's what was happening. Um, and they did it anyway, okay? And um, now... That's a little bit different because we weren't at war with Russia. Um, it was actually Europe, okay, that was concerned about this. And the U.S., I, I, as I read the news, all I know, I have no inside information about this, but it seems to me this was a, it was an attempt of the United States to help Europe, okay, or to say we're, we're, we're doing something we, we can do that doesn't really cost us anything uh, to show that we're on your side or something. In general, Charlie is not in favor of those kinds of things, right? Because it, the, dollar, the dollar system is, uh, however, you know, politics plays in. One of the reasons for the growth of the euro dollar system was that the Russians did not want to leave deposits on, you know, in New York City because they knew that they could, they were not safe there. Okay. So that was kind of the origins of the euro dollar system um, before 71. Um, and so now we're seeing the same thing that the, that, that Russia is holding its reserves 
um, in other currencies and swapping them with private counterparties. So they're trying to evade this. And anyone who knows about money knows that it's very fungible, okay? That the ability to enforce such a thing, you're really going to create innovation um, around the edges. And uh, that's what's happened. Now, you could, you know, you could make an argument, I think, either way, but Charlie is, in, is very definitely viewing the, a unified global monetary system as a public good that benefits everyone, okay? And so it's not a good idea to try to create incentives t- to create a parallel system, you know, that, that's, that, that, that we're, the notion that that's going to be a winning move, <laughs> it's not a winning move, not a winning move for us even, but the dollar system moves. It's a seesaw system, okay? And there's a step back right there, okay? And so uh, we'll see what, what happens going, you know, going forward. Just one final question, you know, for pre- people listening and thinking, oh, I'd like to learn more about Charlie Kinderberger. What, what would you recommend people read of his, you know, he's, I think he wrote 15 books, many, many papers. If you were going to say, hey, uh, you know, here are the most, you know, relevant works that he's written for the, you know, for the current system. What what would you suggest for my next holiday? What should I bring along? Well, the um, world of depression, okay, is, I I mentioned that before, um, which is his story about the 30s. Um, And then I would say maybe um, he wrote, he he put together a, a collection of essays called International economics um, collection of essays. I think it was big. We we call it we we Charlie aficionados call it the big green book. Um, so it, it's a collection of his of his essays, and they're arranged in sort of money, banking, and finance. So it's kind of a treatise in, on money, but it's a collection of like. F- after dinner talks and fest trips. And so it, often they're quite readable, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, but I think that's, it, they're pretty accessible. So I would recommend that. I think it's out of print now, but I got a copy from Abe Books, you know, for like $3. Um, and uh, the, uh, there may be more of them. Um, and uh, that's, uh, I, I treasure that. It's, it's um, I, a lot of what I have tried to deduce about I, I have thought of that as his treatise in money. You know, he never says it is, um, but the way it's arranged, it's structured as if it were a treatise. I think he just, by the time, you know, he was a late bloomer because of the war and depression and everything too. So he's kind of old by the time this is coming out and he doesn't really have the energy, I think, to put together an actual treatise. So he's really just collecting articles that are the, are are the are the are the bricks from which you could construct a, a treatise. So so I and that's really what I think of myself as doing. That's why I was interested in Charlie. That I wanted to learn to think the way he did, so that maybe I can write a tre- treatise at some point. Um, and maybe I'll maybe I'll try to do that uh, as my next book. Um, trying to you know I have this MOOC, this online course, which is but it's really domestic. I was I was doing. Marcia Stigum. I didn't really know about global money when that was published in 2012. And so it's 10 years later, and now I've written this book. So I think extension to international money uh, theory, okay, is my next project. On, on the shoulders of giants, on the shoulders of, of, of Charlie. Everyone called him Charlie, by the way. So the fact that you're calling him Charlie, I'm calling him Charlie, we're, we're, he, he, everyone called him Charlie. Because I think maybe Kindleberger is a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> well, listen, I, I hope you do uh, write that treatise, but in the meantime, listeners should pick up uh, Money and Empire. That's your, that's your most uh, recent book. It's an excellent read, both for the history of dollar, but also the history of a really a fascinating character. So thanks for, uh, thanks for writing it, and thanks for joining us, and uh, wish you all the best. Thanks very much. It was fun. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Niels. Thank you so much, Perry and Kevin, for a wonderful history lesson about Charles Kindleberger, who ranks as one of the 20th century's best-known and most influential international economists, but that many people may not have heard about. There were a few key takeaways for me, such as the important difference in the evolution of the traditional US dollar swap lines into this new FEMA repo facility, which seems to have been developed very deliberately to deal with the next crisis as and when it comes, 
because in reality, it was not really used during COVID when it was first announced. Of course, the whole issue about the role of the US dollar system and how it's really like selling liquidity services to the rest of the world and how you don't need to be a deficit country on the trade account in order to be a key currency provider was quite fascinating. I also found Paris' view about how he believes that the global currency system was not created at Bretton Woods and, of course, what he thinks that Charles Kindleberger would have said to the confiscation of the Russian currency reserves that we saw after the Ukrainian crisis began. That's it for today. Make sure you go and follow Paris and Kevin's work as well as getting a copy of their books because as you can tell from today's conversation, some of these ideas and topics are not being discussed enough on mainstream media. From Kevin and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you in the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.